Hello and welcome to the Two Man Power Trip of Wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz. With me today, a very special guest, a member of the New England Wrestling Hall of Fame. He's, of course, a former WWF superstar, Mr. Mario Mancini. Mario, welcome to the Two Man Power Trip. How you doing? <laughs> superstar. I'm a superstar. Yes, <laughs> come on. Superstars of wrestling, but I, I don't think I was one of the superstars. But listen, it's very nice to be with you, John. How are you? Good, good. What's going on in your world? What have you been up to? Oh, man, God, what am I not up to? You know, between Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling, uh, you know, organizing that, that's a wrestling school and promotion. My day job, which is at a law firm for 27 years, one daughter up in Presque Isle, Maine, the other one, my youngest one, you know, going back and forth to New Jersey, and my, my oldest, thank God, calm, uh, working for um, uh, a bunch of nuns in Hamden, Connecticut, married, and she's my calm one, so I, I got, <laughs> she doesn't give me any problems, so, um, you know, just trying to juggle things, man, in life, like everybody else, you know, trying to get Christmas shopping done and all that stuff. Nice. Seems like uh, maybe a little too busy right now, but uh, that's the way I it guess. goes. You're crazy, you know what I mean? It's 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 a little nuts, but I'm I'm getting there. So still involved in the wrestling business, still training guys. Is that a kind of a big passion of yours? Obviously, for yeah, me, yeah. You know, I started wrestling school in October of 1983. Uh, Tony Altamar was was uh, my my trainer. He was tag team partners with Lou Albano back in the 60s. They were. They were uh, the Sicilians. He trained me, and um, next year will be 2023. So, if you want to count the wrestling school, this has been a 40 year gig for me. So, yeah, um, you know, I, I I entered the WWF um, on July 31st, 1984, six weeks after my 18th birthday. <laughs> so, wow. Um, I got out in 92. I think it was 92. A lot of people say 91, but I could have sworn my last match was with Rick Rude in Huntsville, Alabama in April of 1992. Anyway, um, and then I kind of mulled around for a few years. Uh, I went started going to college in 94. And, um, you know, it wasn't until 1999 that I, I laced my boots up to work with King Kong Bundy in the Westchester County center for a house show. I wasn't even going to do that, but I heard it was with, with Bundy with Chris. So I had Chris, Chris and I were so close that I had to. So, and then I dabbled again in it in 2007 and, um, to about 2010. And then in 2014, you know, uh, big Steve Tracy got a hold of me and said, let's open up a wrestling school. And we did that. And I got a hold of Roma and, he said, yeah, let's do it. And then Paul Perez came in, who was with the WWF, came in, and all, all four of us are involved there. I think it's the only wrestling school in, in I don't know, I don't, I don't want to dare to say, but I, I think it's the only wrestling school on the East Coast that has four former WWE wrestlers uh, running it. So, um, you know, Paul Perez is no slouch. You know, his, his mother and father were pro wrestlers. He started teaching him how to work when he was 14 years old. So nice. we all know Paul Roma. So, um, you know, we, yeah, you know, I enjoy teaching the young kids. I enjoy, uh, you know, molding somebody that doesn't know, comes in the first day and, and, you know, they sign that contract and they don't know the difference between a, you know, a hammer lock and a padlock. And, you know, eight months later, they're coming through the curtain, you know, with their, yeah with their gimmick on, you know what I mean? So it's a good feeling. So, yeah, I'm still at it, John. I'm still at it. And making headlines uh, recently, right? I mean, with this Nine Lies of Vince McMahon documentary. Seems Bro, like we're making... missing it right now, brother. I'm on yeah. with you. I'm, we're not yeah. watching it. Yes. <laughs> Got to DVR it. I always DVR those shows anyway. I can't stand the commercials. So I just, I love to go back, watch it, fast forward to the commercials. Boom. Yeah, you're yeah. in, you're out. I got a DVR right now, too. Well, you know, it, it, listen. Uh, Rita's like a sister to me. Um, she came walking into to Passarello's Quest in Orange, Connecticut, where the first graduating class out of that wrestling school, can I use the word graduating? The first graduating class out of that wrestling school was Mario Mancini, AJ Petrucci, Dave Barbie, and Seth Cohen, who worked as Robbie Parliament. You know, shortly after that, 
you know, uh, after we turned pro, Rita Marie came, Rita Chatterton came walking in. She wanted to be a referee. And, you know, she used her first and middle name, Rita Marie, and um, she trained to be a referee. And, and before you know it, she was ripe, you know, to go in and, and, and do it and didn't know she was going to do it at, at the level she did it at. You know, she started off with small shows and stuff, independence, and, and um, you know, she kept going, trying to get a shot, and they gave her a shot and, uh, you know, like like a brother would, I said, stay away from everybody. Don't go near anybody. <laughs> Just stay to yourself. Don't stay away from Vince. And um, I, you know, we all did the best we could to try to protect her. But back then, John, it it was it was the wild wild west. Let me tell you something, brother. If you were in the wrestling business back then, you would, after the first year, you know, you would, it was amazing. It, you got to remember something. I broke in eight months before WrestleMania won. Um, it was very small, very close shop, very tiny. There was me, Iron Mark Sharp. SD Jones, Steve Lombardi. Steve, I don't, I don't mind saying your name now with 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 kindness because I got everything off my chest when I saw you. So, mm. <laughs> so that's another story I won't go into. But I, right, you right. know, I, I love you, Steve. Don't you know? What I mean, it's all over now, buddy. Uh, Steve Lombardi, uh, Johnny Rods, Charlie Fulton. What a great guy, Charlie Fulton. Oh my God. Um. Jose Luis Rivera. I can't even say his name without laughing. Oh, Jose Luis Rivera. Jose Luis Rivera. And there were Snuka, Piper, Morocco, Ordendorf, Valentine, the Samoans, the Moon Dogs, Andre, Big John Stud, um, Adrian Adonis. Uh, did I say Piper? Um, it wasn't, it really wasn't that big. Tito Santana. Junkyard Dog, it really wasn't that big. George Scott was the booker, and um, it was it was kind of tiny. And it, it was George that started bringing all the guys in. You know, one of my famous stories is um, Chief J. Strongbow was a second dad to me. He was a second father. Uh, he watched out for me. He was my mentor. Uh, he's the one that taught me a lot about the business, as he would say, he taught me a, a, to stay away from the gaga. And, um, you know, he was he was a dear friend of mine. Um, so I'm with Strongbow and this guy walks by with 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 pink trunks on with Eminem on his trunks. And he had this hay, he had hair that looked like, you know, it was stuck on with hay. And it would just flop when he walked, right? And I, I I, never saw him before. It was his first day in the dressing room. So I go, Chief, who's the guy with my initials on his trunks? He goes, what? I go, who's the guy with my initials on his trunks? Who's that? How come I can't have my initials on my trunks? He goes, Mancini, shut up. Mind your own business. I go, Chief, he's got my initial, initials on his trunks. I can't wear my initials on my trunks. I'd like to put Eminem on my trunks. Who the hell is that? He goes, that's Macho Man. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. So um, he started bringing, he brought in Randy Savage and March of 85, Bundy came in and, you know, everything, everything started changing. You know, um, all these different guys started coming in. Of course, Beefcake was already there because he was attached to the hip to Hogan. But I love Eddie. Right. I love Eddie. <laughs> it's just Eddie's Eddie, and um, and George. I like George. I would I would have had a, quite a different career if George stayed, but George got fired, and then Pat came in, and Pat was there for a lifetime. So. Um, 
yeah, it was it was pretty. Um, my, my point is this: it was the wild, wild west. Anything went really it, crazy stuff. I mean, I mean, just just insane things went on. And this is what I always said. That, well, I said it once. Um, I'm not going to mention anything. I, I did a documentary with a major company for a major network that's in pre pre production. And um, a very big producer, uh, lover to death. But uh, what I had mentioned was, you know, John, when you have the ball, it's your ball. Yep. And you say when the game's going to be played because John's going, this is my ball. I own it. It's mine. Yep. But – when you decide, and and you can be a scoundrel, and and it's your ball. You own it. But when John decides to start passing the ball, i.e., going public, then you have people to answer to. Yeah, you have shareholders, you have board of directors. You, now it's not your ball anymore. So. You know, it, <laughs> it, it's like my match with DiBiase with my singlet on. Prior to that, I had separated my shoulder, my AC joint, and I stopped powerlifting because I couldn't because of my shoulder, but I kept eating. So as a result, I, I put on 30 pounds. Oh, so, wow. so what I'm trying to say is, you know, if you're going to go public and you were the wild, wild west, you can't go public and, and keep being the wild, wild west. You got to clean up. You got to clean up. You, you got to walk straight line. You know, that you got people to answer to now. It's not your ball anymore. So, um, you know, listen, all I did, all I did was, was tell the truth. And I'm going to tell you the same thing I told everybody else. After I went to college, I went to law school. So um, I'm no dummy. So am I saying what was what was said to me was true? I don't know. You know what was asked of me? Was it communicated to you? And the answer is yes. Was it communicated to you, communicated to you in 1986? And the answer is yes. Now, you can question the content. That wasn't, the, that wasn't the question. The question was, was it communicated to you? And the answer is, yeah, it was. It was communicated to two people. Me and Andre the Giant. Andre's not here, unfortunately. I am. So it all, all fell on me. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, there have been some recent findings um, a snippet with another wrestler that that said that she had told him the same thing like in 89 or 88 um and he didn't believe her but then uh that that um that 1992 special they had where they had Reed on there he was watching and said hey she told me that a few years ago maybe there was something to that but um you know, I was asked the question and, 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 and I answered it and, and people need to know that, you know, I have, I have to maintain a higher standard than the normal person. Um, you know, when, when you're in, when you're working in the field of law, and especially if you've gone to law school, you know, you, you, you're, you know, uh, my ethics professor, he came in the first class, slammed the door, walked to the podium, and the first sentence out of his mouth was, if you're going to be a lawyer, you need to be a lawyer 24-7. And, and that means somebody gives your girl a, a, a bad look at a bar, you can't whack them out, you need to get in a lot of trouble. Yep. You're going to get a lot of trouble, you know what I mean? And it's the same thing with everything else. You you just, you have to watch yourself. 
You know what I mean? You're you're held to a higher standard. And, you know, I'm not going to be in front of some committee and they say, hey, you were asked a question and we found out that you lied. You know, not going to lie. Was it communicated to me? Yeah, it was communicated to me. Yeah. In tears, shaking like a leaf. So um, those are the headlines, John. What else do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I did see uh, in the Wall Street Journal, Greg the Hammer Valentine. I know he got he got a lot of heat for it, but he said that she told him that, and he doesn't believe it. And then he made a comment that she's not good looking enough for Vince, or something like that. And that's where he, people got mad. Not that he said that he didn't believe her, or maybe that's why they were mad too. But also because he was saying something about her look. So I think Valentine caught some heat from the from that too, especially as Wall Street Journal put it right front front and center there too. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I challenge anybody to go back or suggest to anybody to go back on YouTube if you can catch it and catch her appearance on Tuesday Night Titans. Rita was a very attractive woman. She was. She was. She was a pretty girl. You know what I mean. We all get mm -hmm. old. Right. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Hammer too. I love Hammer, but we. You know, he's getting old too. Yeah. Hammer is one of the closest closest friends I have. Hammer, I love Hammer. Um, but you have to remember something. I didn't break into the to the entertainment business. I didn't break into that. I broke into the wrestling business, and it was about the wrestling. Greg Valentine's father was Johnny Valentine. Oh yeah. If you went into a Webster dictionary and looked up professional wrestler, they should have Greg Valentine's picture right there as an example. Greg Valentine is the quintessential professional wrestler. He's a wrestler. You know, he is pro wrestling. You know what I mean? So guys like like Greg and guys like Bret Hart and, and Don Morocco, um, you know, Bruno San Martino, these guys were wrestlers and I modeled myself after Bruno San Martino, my style of wrestling. If I could have ever showed it or displayed it, <laughs> if I could ever showed it or displayed it, I really was a great wrestler. <laughs> so, so, and if you think about it, they held on to me for that long. Yeah. So, so I had to have something to me. Right. So I really was a good wrestler. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I, I talk to guys like Matt Stryker and, and stuff, and, and he tells me how, the, you know, it's all scripted. The, the the matches are scripted. If you go off script, you're in a lot of trouble. And the promos are all scripted. And I, I just couldn't survive in, in that kind of environment. Um, you know, these guys were, were natural talents. I, I want anybody, I want anybody to go on YouTube and watch Don Morocco's promo with Vince McMahon prior to the steel cage match in 1983 with Jimmy Snuka. Everything was just off the top of his head. That whole promo was just him yep. talking. And it was one of the greatest promos I've ever seen in my life. You know what I mean? So, um, that's when talent was really talent and and we cared about what we did in the ring. I had a student tonight. He goes, hey Mario, can I bail off the second rope? I go, why? I don't I go, you want to do a front flip onto the canvas on the um from the second rope? Yeah. I go, why? I don't know. I just want to see what it's like. I said, let me tell you something. Every single thing that you do in the ring, it's got to be for a reason, not for nothing. And it's got to make sense why you're doing it. So I really scared the hell out of him. Of course, like every other student, after he did it, he was like, ah, hey, that was fun. I said, I'm going to do one better for you. I'm going to teach you how to climb the top rope right now. He's going to catch you on the top rope and slam you from the top. What? Yeah. Well, uh, I said, let me tell you something that's going to screw you in your wrestling education. That's fear. Fear will always get in your way. And it will take you forever to learn. So get rid of the fear. Number one. Number two, I would never have you do anything in this wrestling school that I think you can't do and or you will hurt yourself. 
So the trust is in me. Get to the top rope. So he gets to the top rope. The other wrestler comes over. And it, off the it's just a front flip off top rope onto the he took the bump in the middle. And I looked and he says, ah, hey, that was cool. You know, and you want to go in there and stiff him, you know what I mean? That was cool. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Try listening to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you know what I tell everybody, and they really get blown away by it, but it makes sense. So at Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling, you start off with me before you go to Roma. You 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 have to graduate my one on one before you get to Roma. Why? Well, I teach you how to bump, hit the ropes, hit the turnbuckles, front flips, you know, um, sunset flips, you know, all that stuff. I'm one of the top five losers, <laughs> jobbers. Don't call me an enhancement talent. I'm not a human Viagra. <laughs> so I, I'm one of the top five jobbers. In pro wrestling history, who better to teach you how to fall than me? There's nobody who's better to teach you how to fall than me. So that's why you right. start out with me. Because I teach you what I know. I've done it a million times. So, and then when I feel that they're they're good enough to go to Roma, they go to Roma because Roma climbs the ropes without any hands. I've never seen anybody do that back then, but he did. He's got the highest drop kick in pro wrestling history. He went a lot farther than I did. He was a lot more famous than I than I was. You know, he's a four horseman, two-time tag team champion of WCW. Tag team partners were Hercules Hernandez with power and glory. You know what I mean? So, Roma, they go to Roma to get polished and both of us give them a, a a lot of doses of psychology, ring psychology. So um, it, it works pretty well. Rome and I have been brothers for 38 years. We come out of the same wrestling school. He came after. he. I got – I turned pro in July of 84. Roma turned pro December of 84 out of the same wrestling school. So um, we've been we've been brothers for 38 years, so – a couple more years would be 40. I think we'll throw a big party. Nice. <laughs> That's great. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so it, works, did, it works pretty well. So how did you actually get into WWF? We're talking about, you know, you being there from basically 84 to, to, to early 92. How did you actually get in? Like, how do you break in? Well... <laughs> It was 1980. I was 14 years old. And it was summertime. I think it was June, beginning of July. Uh, because I think that year Shea Stadium was in August of 1980. The show at Shea Stadium. And I was sleeping out in a tent with my best friend in the backyard is what 14 year olds do. And, um, my sister had screamed through the bathroom window. You better get up here. Now it was after midnight on a Saturday. She goes, you better get up here now. So I ran up there and, uh, Vince McMahon was sitting in a, a empty arena and Bruno San Martino was sitting next to him. And it was my two brothers, my two sisters. My eldest sister was married. My two brothers, my two sisters, and my mother and father in the living room. And so I ran up there, and I looked at the TV. And Vince said, uh, Bruno, you have something to tell your fans. And he said, yeah, I'm retiring. My last match will be in Shea Stadium against George Animal Steel. And... I was like beside myself because as everybody was rooting for Reggie Jackson and Carlton Fisk and Pete Rose, Bruno was my guy. Football, baseball, it was just Bruno. So I looked at the TV and I looked at my family and I said, I'm going to be a pro wrestler. 
I said, I'm I'm going to wrestle for the WWWF. That's what it was back then, the World Wide Wrestling Federation. I said, I'm going to wrestle for the WWWF. I'm going to be the next Bruno San Martino. I'm going to take his place. You know, John, it didn't exactly work that way. Hmm, right. He, like, took Frank Williams' place. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> hey, he was great, Frankie Williams. <laughs> so... Now it's 83. I'm on second second row on the floor in New Haven Coliseum. My mother and father and my sister and brother are with me. Tony Altamar was refereeing. He goes up the ring stairs. My father stands up and goes, Tony, Tony. And Tony looks over, looks at my mother and father and goes, hey, Ralph, Gloria, how are you? I go, you know that guy? He goes, yeah, that's the Stanford Stomper, Tony Altamar. We went to grammar school with him. He was a lifeguard in Stanford for years. We grew up with him. Wow. Next New Haven, I'm there at 5 o'clock. Tony Altamar parks across the street, comes walking in. Going into the arena, I said, Mr. Altamar? He goes, yeah. I said, I, I want to be a professional wrestler. He said, uh, what's your last name? I said, Inza Terry. He said, your mother and father, Ralph and Gloria? I go, yeah. He goes, what do you, I go, I, I just finished my, 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 uh, my junior year of high school. He goes, Finish your senior year and go to college. I go, going to a trade school. This isn't for you. I went to the Hartford Civic Center. Waited for him there. Hmm. You again? I said, yeah, Mr. Altima, I want to be a wrestler. He goes, ooh. I went to Madison Square Garden. Now, John, I got to tell you, I passed Madison Square Garden about seven times, and I didn't know it was Madison Square Garden because I was, I just got my license. I had a 1965 Chrysler Newport a rust bucket, and I'm in New York City driving for my life because I thought for sure somebody was going to hit me. Finally, when I stopped the cop, he says, it's right, right there, right in front of you. Found him in Madison Square. He goes, kid, you're crazy, huh? <laughs> Come to the next New Haven. Be there at 3 o'clock. Okay. I go to the next New Haven. It's 3 o'clock. I said to the guard, Tony Altamar is expecting me. Tony comes and gets me. We we go into the arena. The ring's already set up. Now I'm... Wow. You know, I'm, I'm walking to, toward the ring. You know, and Kurt Henning was in there giving drop kicks off the top rope to Seth, who ended up going to wrestling school with me. He was giving them drop kicks off the top rope, and Fuji was instructing him. So Tony had said to Fuji, he wants to be a pro wrestler. Well, um, I got a lesson that day, and um, it was pretty bad. And just when they thought I was going home with my tail between my legs, I said, when can I come back? Nice. And they said, because I tell you what, kid, I'm opening up a wrestling school in Orange, Connecticut. Be there first Saturday of October. 83. First Saturday of October at nine o'clock in the morning. Okay. So I had to wait a couple months. That first Saturday came, I showed up. Um, he was getting a ring, taught me how to bump, beal, flip out of the corner, hit the ropes. So, okay. I mean, it, it felt so natural to me. It, 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 you know, I knew I, I found somewhere where I belonged. So I go, well, what do I have to do, for, you know, from here? And he goes, well, it's a $3,000. Oh my God. I said, no. Oh. So I went home and my brother, Bob, who was a pretty successful guy, he goes, how'd it go? I said, good. How'd you feel? I said, it felt great. You going to do it? I go, yeah, I'm going to do it in 85. 
He goes, why 85? I said, well, it's $3,000. I I need to work and save the money. It's going to take me a while. You know, I was cooking and washing dishes at a restaurant, you know, and he goes, oh, okay. All right. So we got up Sunday morning. He goes, come on, let's take a ride. He goes, follow me. I go, why can't I just go with you? He goes, follow me. So I followed him. And he's driving. I go, no, he can't be going there. And he's getting closer and closer. He pulls into the gym. So I park behind him. We both go walking in there. He walks up to Tony Altamar with an envelope with $3,000 in it. And he goes, you better not kill my brother. And he walked out and he looked at me. He said, give it hell. Give it everything you have. And Tony Altamar looked at me and said, get a ring. Then 10 months later, uh, I went to Poughkeepsie. And my first match was against Greg Valentine. (laughs) And uh, the way Tony trained us was sparring. On my kids. And I never swear on my kids. We're sparring. Because we're friends. But when we turn pro, we really have to apply this stuff. Even to his own damn wrestling students, Tony's protecting kayfabe. So now I'm downstairs. I signed my contract with Gorilla Monsoon. We all did. And he introduces me to Chief J. Strong. <laughs> he goes, um, I want you to listen to everything that Chief tells you, okay? I said, okay. I said, what would you like me to do, Mr. Strong? We're going to see that chair? Sit down and shut up. I said, okay. So a little while later, Chief comes up to me and goes, go talk to Valentine. I go, why? He goes, you're working with him. I said, I'm wrestling him. He said, yeah. I said, is this a title match or a non-title match? Because I'm going to beat him. He'll never get that figure four on me. I'll tell you that right now. I'll beat him. And he looks at Tony Omar. <laughs> Tony goes, Tony's going to do one of these. Yeah. He goes, go talk to Valentine. I said, Chief, I'm not talking to him. I'm not talking to him. I'm going to wrestle him. Looks over at Tony Altamont. <laughs> Tony puts his arm around me, walks walks me away a little bit. He goes, listen to me. I never steered you wrong yet, right? I go, no. He goes, go talk to Valentine. I said, okay. So I go walking up to Greg and I go, Greg Valentine? Yeah. I go, Mario Mancini, I'm wrestling you. I'm wrestling. I'm not working with him. I'm wrestling. I'm wrestling you. Right, yeah. So he goes, When I slap that figure four on you, keep your legs really loose, like noodles. He goes, if you keep them stiff, you're going to hurt yourself. I'm not going to hurt you. So make sure you're very loose. And I kept a poker face, but inside of me just died. And I went, well, it's a setup. I have to lose. Yeah. It's a setup. So right away I said, Can I do something? He goes, what, do you want a comeback? I go, yeah. Can I do something? Can I get a comeback? He goes, yeah. I go, great. What can I do? He goes, after you submit for the figure four, get your ass off the canvas and come back to the dressing room. (laughs) And I went, okay. That was it. That was it. That, you know, I, I I think we were on the third hour. There were three hours of taping. So I Poughkeepsie was a long hallway. It was like a mile to get to the payphone. So I went to the payphone. I called Home Collect. And my brother Ralph, who got me involved in pro wrestling when I was seven years old, showing me Bruno on a 12-inch black and white TV, my mother answered the phone. 
and I said, put Ralphie on the phone. So my brother came on the phone. I said, Ralph, I have to lose. I go, it's predetermined. I'll never say it's fake. Right. Absolutely. My, my, my herniated disc in, in my low back won't say it. My bulging disc in my neck won't say it. My complete shoulder replacement that I need in my left shoulder won't say it. The torn medial meniscus in my left knee won't say it. I said, it's predetermined. He said, I, I have to lose. He goes, no way. No way. Who are you wrestling? Greg Valentine. He goes, you can beat him. I go, Ralph, you don't get it. He goes, no, it isn't. I go, Ralph, I'm right here. <laughs> All right. I, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm on the other side of the TV now. And you know, John, that that was probably the most. You know what? When the millennium came, so many people overused the word surreal. So I hate that word because so many people used it. I don't say I don't like saying it. It was just strange because as I was standing in the corner in Poughkeepsie for my first match, I was waiting for the red light to come onto the camera, and Howard Finkel standing there, and I had thirty seconds to think to myself. I'm in the TV. He said, I used to be on the other side watching this. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm in the TV. This is mind blowing. I'm like, holy shit. I'm in the TV now. And it was, it was really weird. You know, um, I have a t-shirt with um, pro wrestling tees. It says, yeah, I, I'm a jobber. For the biggest effing company on the planet. So you know what? Yeah, people were used to seeing Mario Mancini, you know, getting pummeled every Saturday, right? But I did it for the biggest company in the world. And, you know, I'm 56 now. And I'm sure there's a lot of 56-year-old guys sitting in their chair watching TV right now, whether they're, you know, whether they watch the NFL or Major League Baseball or pro wrestling or basketball or hockey. And they used to do that at some level. And they dream. They just have a fantasy and a dream of if they went all the way. You know what I mean? And it's very rare. And I'm very lucky to have had a dream. And that dream actually came true. It's unbelievable. That's why I say when you when you watch Dark Side of the Ring and these Shawn Michaels and all these other guys, come on, Mick Foley, and, you know, they show them as little kids being Jimmy Snuka. And, you know, it was always wrestling. And they had this dream. And then they became a big superstar. I had the same dream, guys. I just didn't get the break you did. My dreams weren't any different than theirs. I had the same ones. I, I wanted, I went up to Strongbow and I said, I got an idea. I got an idea. I got an idea, Chief. Go ahead, Mancy. Put me with Piper. Yeah. Piper's going to give me the most brutal beating he's ever given anybody. I mean, it's going to be brutal. I'll gig brutal beating. Okay. As he's putting the boots to me, as I'm laying there dead, he looks over at Bruno. He says, is this one of your relatives? Is this one of your grease balls? Is this one of your guineas? Is this one of your wops? Bruno comes in, cleans house with him takes me i said chief i will live in a gym i will go on the gas i will change my whole body i promise you i promise you i if i can get it get a guarantee you know i will do what i need to do and then i could start an angle with piper with bruno in my corner that's all he did That's great, kid. That's a great idea. But it's already been done. I go, it has. He goes, 
Yeah, because in the end, what Vince is going to want is you turn on Bruno. That's where the real money is. He goes, and Larry Zabisco already did it. Yeah. He goes, it's no good. I go, I don't have to turn on Bruno. He goes, you have to. That's where the money is. Not with Piper. It's with Bruno. And Bruno doesn't want to work like that anymore. I go, Chief, please. It doesn't have to be that way. It could be a, it could be a different angle. It doesn't have to be that way. He goes, not going to go for it. Already been done. I went up to Vince himself. I went up to Vince McMahon himself. I said, put a tool belt on me. Put the red hat on me. I'll go, give me the ring music. I'll go out as Super Mario Mancini. I go, the finish is an ass bump off the top rope. So the guy gets up from a suplex or a slam while I go to the top. When I come off the top rope, I spread my legs and ass bump him on the chest. Like the video game. That's the finish. I'd have to pay Nintendo. Hmm. Because I don't want to do that. And then I, I, I started being, by like the, the sixth, seventh year, I started becoming sarcastic. Like stupid. Going, hey, Chief, how about the first ring fatality? Give me one big payoff and I won't come back. You know what I mean? So, um, Morocco tried to help me. Um, DiBiase tried to help me um, get an angle. Um, just, uh, just didn't happen. Um, I didn't have it. Uh, you know, if... The ultimate warrior gets off an airplane in the middle of June in a tank top. 150 people are going to turn their head and go, oh, my God, look at that guy. You know, six foot four, you know. I get off the plane in the tank top in the middle of June, and an 11-year-old kid is going to look at his mother and go, is that Uncle Phil? And she's gonna go. No, he just looks like Uncle Phil. You know what I mean? So <laughs> right, right. I didn't. You know what I mean? I could pretty yep. much fit st and, and stand out in the crowd. Um, I wasn't bloodborne into the business. I, I had no, I had no entry that way, no right of entry, I should say. Right. And and the guys that do, total respect, total respect. Hey, my father worked at a bearing factory for forty three years. I'm sure if I walked up to them. Couple of years after he retired, now I was ready to work, you know. And I said, "Hey, Ralph's my dad." Oh, geez, Ralph was a great worker. Come on in, you know. And he'd he let me right in, right? Yep. <laughs> I, I'm a, you know, I have, I'm a blood relative, right? I didn't have that in wrestling, um, and and I don't begrudge them because that's their right. That's their right. I applaud them. That's their right. So. Um, you know, Bret Hart was a pro wrestler when, you know, when, when, when he was in his mother's stomach, you know what I mean? That, yep. Uh, you know, and, and God bless those people. Good for them. The third way <laughs> would be to get a push from behind and, um, I'm just not made up that way. So then the people that are, um, that's your choice. And I support your choice, whatever, whatever your orientation is, but it's, it's, it, and I don't have anything against it. Um, but it's not mine. So I didn't go that way. Um, so I had nothing. I was over three. I, I didn't stand out in the crowd. I didn't have any blood relation and I was a heterosexual. So um, three strikes and you're out. You know what I mean? You could be, you know, look at Paul Roma came in cold. He had no bloodline, no nothing. He also had the best body in pro wrestling. If you were in that dressing room and you looked at Roma and you looked at everybody else, Roma had symmetrically, he had the best body in wrestling. Bar none. So, and he was an incredible athlete, best athlete I've ever seen in my life. I mean, this guy was in wrestling school and he would standing still, 
he would just leap and put his two feet on the on the counter. And the counter was one of those high counters that came up to your chest, like four and a half feet off the ground. And he would just leap and stand on the thing. Agile as – couldn't believe it. So he's a talented guy. Good jib. <laughs> you know, um, I remember in 85, I looked at him on an airplane. We were We were – we were coming back from Canada. We were in Buffalo. I said, why the hell did you get into pro wrestling? Why don't you just go to Hollywood? I go, why don't you just go straight to Hollywood? Why even bother with this? And he laughed. And I called him Hollywood ever since then. I call, hey, Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. What's, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, Roma Roma had it with the female fa- fans. You, you know, the young stallions did. Yeah, big the, time. The, 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 huge. But Jimmy, Jimmy had his problems. And if you you've researched podcasts and you've watched Roma, you you would figure out what those problems were, and they couldn't stay together, and that was that. But they uh. They made a lot of women's temperatures rise. That's for sure. The young stallions. So uh, I and and I didn't have that. I didn't. I you know, um, as they say on YouTube, John, the comments on my videos, they go, "Who couldn't forget Mario Mancini with that '80s porn stash and that pasty white skin?" You know, Roma <laughs> tried. Roma tried to work with me so many times. You know what I mean? Diet, weightlifting. I mean, on me constantly. And he's like, you know, we're eating on the road. He's like, you can't eat that. You can't eat that. You know, we're in Tennessee. And he came back with a box of Goo Goo Clusters. He goes, what are those? I go, remember the Reggie bars? He goes, yeah. I goes, these are replica Reggie bars. They're delicious. He goes, let me ask something, Mancini. Did you have one? I went, yeah. He goes, you did eat one, right? He goes, I go, yeah. He goes, and then you had to go back in and get a whole box. How many in that box? I go, there's only six. He goes, he had to go in and get a whole box. Hmm. So he he tried to work with me as much as he could. You know what I mean? So, But he would say, listen, could you at least get a tan? Can you do that? Could you at least <laughs> yeah. get a tan? You know? Yeah. But by 1989, which was, I don't know if it was too late or not, Chief used to call Mr. Roma. I go, yeah, not quite, Chief. Not quite. But I started powerlifting. And I was in a 242-pound weight class. And I was deadlifting 500. I was squatting 500. I was benching uh, 415. Um, and, you know, I was all gassed up. I was all, I was all righted up, you know. And if you watch my match with Playboy Buddy Rose, you'll say, well, yeah, his body changed considerably there. And you watch my, even my match with, with Taker, um, that too. I was able to wear trunks. My stomach was flat. You know what I mean? Compared to the to the singlet I wore against DiBiase, where I was like, I don't know, 285. <laughs> right, yeah. So I I you know, I'd walk around the dressing room all puffed out and everything, and Chief would go, Oh, Mr. Roma. And I go, No, 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 Chief, not quite, not quite, Mr. Roma. Not yet, you know. But I, I started lifting a lot, you know, and um and I started getting in shape, but, you know, and I thought that was going to help. I thought Vince would notice, you know, the Patterson would notice and, um, you know, maybe something would happen, you know, well, speak of the devil. It's Paul Roma. Now, let me, let me explain to you something, John. See, it's Paul Roma right here. He'll peek his head around so you can see him. You know what I mean? Now you got Mario Mancini on here, right? Yes. Yes. But. You know what? If you're gonna get Paul Roma, hey, Mr. Roma, how you doing? Yeah, if you're gonna get Paul Roma. That's gonna take some negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> but you always can get me for free because <laughs> I'm Mario Whatever Mancini. Whatever Mario Mancini tells you is the truth. <laughs> yeah. yes. Listen, I'm um, you get me for free. So Roma, you gotta negotiate a little bit. <laughs> Hey, you so, were according to Strombo, you were Roma. So there you go. Well, well, yeah, he used to, you know, that those that those two years when I was all puffed out and everything, 
you know, I'd walk around the dressing room. He goes, eh, Mr. Roma. I go, yeah, not quite, Chief. Not quite. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, so, uh, yeah, fun years. But, hey, they kept you around for a very long time. And I think that's Undertaker's official, unofficial debut was against you there. So, I mean, yeah. they put a bunch of trust in you. They must have liked you a little bit. Well, they, you know, they, they – I was um, I was Hercules Hernandez's debut match, King Kong Bundy's debut match, Taker's debut match. I, I was Big Bully Busick's debut match. I was Demolition's debut match twice. Twice. Because first they had Randy Colley. Right. And then Barry. Yep. And then Barry. So I did both debut <laughs> debuts there. Um, I missed Savage by one match. I was a second match. A guy was there before me. I, I was almost his. Um, so I think it was more or less Strongbow had trust in me because he used to, to make out the board. And I think he had the, the trust and faith in me that, you know, for the first time with these guys getting over, that, you know, put them with me and I'll get them over. I'll get them over well. It's just like uh, before WrestleMania won, they needed a stretcher with Orndorff, a pile driver on the concrete floor. It's me. Before WrestleMania three with Bundy with the midgets, they, they want them to do a stretcher to make them look strong and grab the microphone and say that's what that's what's going to happen. Any midget that gets in front of me, they needed a stretcher. I did it. So, right. um, you know, that's I, I, I even vied for my own doll with Vince. Vince liked the idea. He laughed. He never made it though. I said, Vince, can I can I get a figure? He goes, You want an action figure? I said, Yeah. <laughs> Would have been cool. Hey, would have been cool. Roma. I'm not wearing that, Roma. I said, yeah. I said, yeah, I want an action figure. He goes, what's so special about your action figure, Mario? I said, mine comes with an ambulance, a stretcher, and two paramedics. And, man, did he laugh. Did he? He goes, I love that. I love that. I go, then make it. Make it. Yeah. One guy, though, that made Roma's doll – he does want to make a doll of me. The only thing is I'm past production. So he wants to take three different or four different dolls and Frankenstein a Mario. <laughs> Good idea. That's, yeah. That's yeah. the term he used to. He wants to take all these different body parts and Frankenstein a Mario Mancini doll together. Good idea. So, I like uh, it. Uh, you know, I don't know. Listen, I signed a contract over a year ago to do a 41 part documentary on wrestling and one of the parts is in, is is jobbers and i guess whoever participates in the documentary gets an action figure made of themselves uh, wow. and i haven't heard a damn thing. <laughs> i haven't heard a damn thing yet but i signed the contract <laughs> i haven't heard anything yet though um if it's still in the works or or if it's dead i don't know but we'll you know we'll see Hey, sounds good. But as we, we hope to wind down here, we'll head towards the finish. we got to get you on for part two because you barely scratched the surface here. But we'll get you on again, hopefully. Fingers crossed we'll get you on again. Just name some of your, like, the favorite guys that you worked with, obviously, in the many years in the business. I'm just well, one curious. Standing right, one standing right in front of me, even though he made me puke my brains out. <laughs> Roma made me throw up. <laughs> Was it nice, man? My brother. So I go into the New Haven Coliseum, right? Just to hang with the guys. I'm not booked. I just hang with them. Laugh. That was the best part. The dressing room was the best. Not the wrestling. The dressing room was the best part. So it was about, you know, 5 o'clock, 5.15. So I looked over at Strong Boy. I said, Chief, I'm starving. I'm going to go get some Chinese food. You want anything? He goes, nah. So, you know, it's like 1985. I go and eat like $20 worth of Chinese food which was the equivalent of probably $65 today. So I come back all barrel bellied and everything. And I walk through and he goes, Oh, good kid. I'm glad you're back. I go, why? He goes, I need you. I go, huh? He goes, yeah. I go, who am I working with? He goes, Roma. I go, Oh, great. So I go and see Roma. I go, Hey, Roman, we're working together. Real happy, man. Real happy. Because I know it's going to be a good match. Right? I go, there's only one thing, man. I just ate a ton of Chinese food. He goes, oh, did you? 
already uh -huh. pissed about the Google clusters. Yep. I, I, he goes, oh, did you? I go, yeah. He goes, well, you have two choices. You either go in the bathroom, put your finger down your throat and get rid of it, or you're going to get rid of it out there. And I went, ah. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> So I go in the ring, right? Bell rings. Roma starts crisscrossing. Son of a bitch. I have to crisscross with him. Right. Yeah. I have to. Why well, can't just stand there? He's crisscrossing and crisscrossing and crisscrossing. My boneless ribs are right here. Right? My freaking low mane is right here. He, you know, he drops down. I hit the other rope. He leapfrogs me, drop kicks. I screw out of the ring, go onto the floor, lift up the apron, and go. Bruh! Bruh! Went in and had a great match. Um, so Roma, Ted DiBiase, Bret Hart, Bundy <laughs> loved working with Bundy. It was, you know, what the funniest thing about Bundy is to the 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 average wrestling fan back there, he'd walk out and he would just scare the bejesus out of everybody. He yeah. was just a mountain of a man, and the look on his face and his shaved eyebrows—I mean, he just looked like he was going to kill your whole family. The funniest, nicest guy you ever wanted to meet. You know, I just I loved working with him. Um, like I said, Morocco, I love, <laughs> I loved working with Morocco. Um, mainly, uh, 90% of the guys I worked with, I loved working with about 90% of them, you know? So before we let you go, where can everybody find you and, uh, your wrestling school? Where can everybody kind of, you know, find a social media and otherwise? Well, paradise alley pro wrestling, um, dot com. Um, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Paul Roma's the head instructor there, as I mentioned. Everybody starts at the 101 with me, then they're 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 passed on to to Roma for um, all the the aerial stuff and the psychology and everything like that. So they can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, ParadiseAlleyProWrestling.com. They can even if they're interested in being a wrestler, they can even get a hold of Roma directly. You know, and people have done that. So. Um, we're at 662 Co Avenue, 662 Co Avenue in East Haven, um, Connecticut. So, um, you know, we're, we're growing. That's for sure. We're growing by leaps and bounds. And we're pretty happy about that right now because we haven't, we haven't been in a spot like this in, a, in I don't even think since we opened. So it really is booming right now. Thank God. Unbelievable in this economy that it would be, but it is. Um, so if you want to get a spot into the wrestling school, do it now, because, you know, if things keep going the way it's going, we're going to have to cap off and wait until people get done with their education before we can take new people. You know what I mean? Cause that's, that's how busy we're getting. So if, wow, if you're nice. really interested, you're really interested in this. I suggest you, you, you'd move as fast as possible to do it. If you, if that's your dream, you know, so that's good, though. That's a good thing. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, no, that's great. But, Mario, thank you so much for all the time today. I appreciate it. I know you don't like to do a lot of these. So, uh, but definitely, if you want to, you definitely got to have you back on and uh, talk uh, a little oh, bit more. Well, uh, listen, I, get a hold of Maurice. Yep. Tell him you want to do another one. And if he's, you know, I like to keep it limited to cheap heat, although I did do Hannibal. Yep. Um, I was surprised Hannibal wanted me on, but I did, uh, it, it, you know, he wants to do a part three with me. Uh, and it'll, and it's your, it's, it's Hannibal cheap heat and you. So I really don't want to, I don't want to flood the market, you know, hey, sounds good to me. Yeah. You, you only have so many stories, brother, and they're all the same stories. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, know, I got you. you know what I mean? So, yeah. I don't, you know, you only have so many experiences and, and I'm not one to make things up. So, um, there you have it. All right. Thank you so much for all the time. Really appreciate it. Not a problem, man. Anytime.